Good morning and welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And we'll get right to the resumption of our reading and discussion of the book, The Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney. Yesterday we concluded with a brief discussion about, well, the actions of rather sorry about the phone the uh, actions of John Carroll the Jesuit priest in the colonies and John at this time is beginning to show his true colors now we'll back up one paragraph for continuity purposes and pick up where we left off yesterday it says when not attending to weddings and other pastoral duties Carroll that is John Carroll the Jesuit priest, educated 27 years by the Jesuits. He was, well, an oath-bound Jesuit. In other words, he had taken the extreme oath of the Jesuits. Now, it would be appropriate at this time for me to stop the reading of this book and then read you that extreme oath so that you know what this man has sworn his life to. But rather than read that oath again on the air, and I've done so many times, I think it appropriate to instruct the the listeners, if they are willing, to read that oath for themselves. It's called the Extreme Oath of the Jesuits. The Extreme Oath of the Jesuits. And I highly recommend that you take some time within the next few days to read that oath from yourself, and then you will understand what kind of blood courses through the veins of this man, this Jesuit, John Carroll, one of the founders of this country, one who helped foment the Revolutionary War against Protestant Great Britain, one who achieved, through that revolution, Religious freedom for Catholics. And for what purpose? So that Roman Catholicism could survive, number one, seeing it was an extreme minority of the country, eventually to establish a federal government for the United States that was Roman Catholic, and then to gradually, through the civil laws of the land, make America Catholic. Okay? The papacy will be king of kings and lord of lords by hook or by crook. And John Carroll was the vanguard of the Catholicization of America. Now, again, backing up one paragraph for continuity we'll we'll begin now it says when not attending to weddings and other pastoral duties john carroll spent his time overseeing the expanding american and i'll add the words roman catholic church which now included in addition to baltimore dioceses in new york boston philadelphia and louisville kentucky where a number of maryland catholics had migrated His view of the American Roman Catholic Church had evolved, had evolved. What was the original hope? That Roman Catholicism could merely survive. But now, but now, his view of the American Roman Catholic Church had evolved. It's not about just survival now. He says, immediately after the American Revolution, John Carroll favored a distinctly indigenous church, unencumbered by Rome's interference. Later, as bishop, in other words, but now, as bishop, he steered the church to a more conservative, that is, a Council of Trent-style Roman Catholic Church, that denounced Protestantism, denounced Protestants as heretics, and decreed that it was no murder to kill a heretic and to confiscate his property and to Catholicize his children 
and it virtually leveled 100, at least 100 <clears throat> damnations for the uniquely Protestant beliefs and teachings. The Council of Trent was the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent. It was gathered by the Jesuits, it was organized by the Jesuits to proclaim a global war of annihilation against Protestantism. That war was to be led by the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church was going to have to follow one way or another. Okay. Now, it, again, you should read the oath of the Jesuits, the extreme oath of the Jesuits. You know, typical to Roman fashion, when she is in minority, she treads very, very lightly. Okay? When she is at parity, she's a fox. But when she's in the majority... She roars like a lion. Okay, so the Roman Catholic Church in America, the American Roman Catholic Church is biding its time. Well, already some time has elapsed since the Revolutionary War. Catholics now enjoy religious liberty to practice Roman Catholicism. The prejudices against Roman Catholicism are waning because, well, the American Protestants fought side by side with these Catholics, and they appeared to be patriotic and they fought against Protestant Great Britain who was the winner the Protestants in the colonies separating from Protestant Great Britain or the Catholics in the colonies separating from Great Britain okay obviously the only winners of the Revolutionary War were Catholics and yet to Protestants, <clears throat> they appeared to be patriotic Americans, but the Protestants have, well, they've had to quench their fears of this Roman menace. I mean, after all, George Washington suspended the, the practice of the celebration of Pope's Day where they burned the Pope in effigy commemorating the gunpowder plot of 1605. It became, well, politically incorrect to, to burn the Pope in effigy. To remember the gunpowder plot of 1605, it became politically incorrect. You know, so Protestants had to take a step back. Roman Catholics have religious liberty now. It's not about just survival anymore. It's about getting on with the business of the Jesuits, getting on with the business of Catholicizing America. Okay, in the beginning, Charles, or John Carroll favored a distinctly indigenous Roman Catholic Church unencumbered by Rome's interference. Remember, the colonists, the Protestants, would never tolerate any interference with the Pope, the Antichrist of the Bible. But now, as bishop, he steered the Roman Catholic Church in a more conservative, that is, Council of Trent, that's anti-Protestant, more anti-Protestant, and recognizably Roman direction. What is the Roman direction? The Pope rules over the kings of the earth. The old world order has to be reinstalled in the new world order, okay? Just at the very time when the Pope was losing control, was losing Europe, liberty, fraternity, and equality, remember, the revolution and also the Protestant Reformation, the Pope is the Antichrist. At a time when the papacy seemed absolutely dead, the Jesuits even were suppressed at this time. John Carroll is moving in a Roman direction in the colonies. Okay, the second beast is taking on the virtual image of the first beast. It's fulfillment of Bible prophecy right here in this history we're reading. Do, isn't it wonderful that history helps us understand the Bible? 
now you understand why they've worked so hard to keep this history out of the school books. Listen, this book that I'm reading right here on Inquisition Update this morning could not be read in the schools in this country. Do you know that? An ambassador, a former ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, can write a book. It can be sold on the market, but it cannot be read in a public school. This is critical information. This book is to be bought by Roman Catholics so that they understand what direction the Roman Catholic Church is taking in America. This, not, this book is not to be widely read by Protestants, especially true Protestants who still protest the papacy as the Antichrist. They're few and far between. Uh, can't name you another one in my location. I can't name another one in my location. God may have some out there, but they certainly are very quiet about their Protestantism. <clears throat> John Carroll. They've got religious liberty. Now they're going to Romanize the church. They're going to take the American Roman Catholic Church in a distinctly and recognizably Roman direction. I didn't write this. Former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, wrote this. He knows what it means to go in a Roman direction. And you ought to as well. Okay, Carroll remained a strong advocate of the separation of church and state. And I explained that before. I'm going to explain it again. The separation of church and state in the Roman Catholic definition is that they are united. Church and state are united, but they have distinct and separate roles. The role of the church is to make the laws. The role of the state is to implement the laws and enforce the laws. The woman, the church, the beast, the government. Okay? So anytime you hear a Roman Catholic talk about the separation of church and state, he's not saying squat. I want you to know when a Roman Catholic is talking about the separation of church, oh, Protestants don't need to worry about the Roman Catholic Church taking over the government. We're not going to take it over, but we do demand we absolutely demand, and especially after Vatican Council II when the Protestants surrendered, we absolutely demand, we mandate that the government implement church rules, Roman Catholic canon law. Okay, they're separate. Oh, yes, they're separate. We agree in the separation of church and state. The church is separate. The state can never impose its will upon the church. And the church can impose its will on the state, and the state must obey like a servant slave to its master. That's the Roman model. That's the European model. Remember the monarchies of Europe? They were monarchs only because they obeyed the pope and implemented and enforced Roman Catholic canon law. When they ceased to do that, they were overthrown in bloody massacres. So the American Roman Catholic Church, when originally it was hoped to be an indigenous church, completely separate from Rome, now that John Carroll is a bishop, he's going to do his job. Remember the Carroll family, I'm, I'm repeating myself, I know, but this is important. The Carroll family, it's an ancient family, and it originally comes from the homeland, and they were mercenary warriors. They made their incalculable wealth by conquering lands for hire. Okay, there was a struggle for territory and a struggle for power and control in Europe, and the Carrolls jumped right up. Yeah, we'll do it. You pay us so much money, we'll do it. Well, they developed such a name for themselves as, as, as successful warriors in conquering lands for those who had the money to pay them. Rome picked them up as a client. And they conquered Ireland for the Pope. 
they're going to do the same thing in America. This book is showing you how they did it. First, it was very cautiously, very carefully. They tolerated the, the, uh, in, the injustices and the, the uh, humiliation of not even being able to participate in politics in this country. Couldn't say the mass in public. Couldn't be Roman Catholics. Couldn't practice their faith. Now they've got a bishop. <clears throat> now they've got a bishop. And he's now going to take the church in a Roman direction. I hope I'm making sense for this. Uh, uh, of this for you. These are conquerors. The Carroll family are inbred warriors. They know how to conquer. Okay? It says, later as bishop, John Carroll steered the American Roman Catholic Church to a more conservative, that is, Council of Trent, anti-Protestant, and recognizably Roman direction. He remained a strong advocate of the separation of church and state, yada, 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 and of religious pluralism. See, the Pope doesn't care what religion you profess. As long as the government of the land forces you to obey Roman Catholic canon law, you can profess yourself to be a Satanist if you wish. You see, first and foremost, the Roman Catholic Church is a political institution. Look, you, you can tell your own life. You don't see Roman Catholic priests, frocked priests, going up and down the streets proselytizing like the, like the, uh, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, do you? Well, they don't have to. They just take over the government and make you Catholic without your knowledge. See, they don't have to proselytize. They impose Roman Catholicism upon you through the civil law. Nothing has ever changed. Okay? It's the same in this millennium as it was in the old millennium. It's the same in the new world order as it was in the old world order. There's nothing, absolutely nothing new about this new world order that can't be immediately recognized as the reinstitution of the old world order. Okay? He remained a strong advocate for the separation of church and state and of religious pluralism, both inherent American values, but sought to organize and centralize the American hierarchy that is the American Roman Catholic hierarchy. So he's organizing the prelates, the priests, the bishops, the archbishops, the cardinals, the, 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 the entire, well, the priestly class of the Roman Catholic Church in America. He's organizing and centralizing that hierarchy. In other words, he's becoming the American Pope <clears throat> okay, we don't have to so much worry about the Pope over in Europe. He's fighting for his life. We've now got a Jesuit, an oath-spitting Jesuit, an anti-Protestant Jesuit who has literally taken the Pope's place in this country by organizing and centralizing the power, the influence, and the direction of the American Roman Catholic hierarchy. And increasingly, says the author, Listen carefully to echo the European model of Catholicism. What is the European model of Catholicism? Romanism. He is literally creating a virtual image to the first beast, taking on the very likeness of the old world order, which was unification, organization, centralization of the Roman Catholic hierarchy under the Pope and subjecting the kings of the earth to their dictates. Have I added to or taken anything away from what this author is virtually telling you? Flat out admitting. to echo the European model of Catholicism. It's not about an indigenous, colonial Roman Catholic Church that has to live in peace and harmony with, Rome, with uh, American Protestants 
Well, that was the case before, but now he's a bishop. The Revolutionary War is over. England is over across the pond, and she can't touch us anymore. We've got a Declaration of Independence, oh, which, by the way, Charles Carroll was a signer. And uh, now we're going in a Roman direction. You see what happens when you allow that, that most evil to be feared to come into your land? Look, we're Americans. The Constitution means everything to us. Religious liberty means everything to us, right? Let me ask you a question. Was there religious liberty in Israel? Were the Baal worshipers welcome to come? Were, were, were is the Israelites welcome to go out and marry pagans and bring them to Israel? Were, were they allowed to go out and marry foreigners and to raise pagan children in their houses? Or did God punish the Israelites over and over and over for doing such a thing? Look, is there going to be religious liberty in the kingdom of heaven? Is there religious liberty in the kingdom of heaven? Can you call yourself a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and worship Lucifer as a Freemason? I mean, come on. Somebody's destroyed your common sense. Somebody has destroyed your biblical sense. We're to have no part with the heathen. We're not to marry heathen. We're not to raise up heathen babies. The gospel of Jesus Christ is to be a light unto the world. And how can the Jesus Christ and the gospel be the light unto the world if we worship and marry and raise pagans in our houses? The greatest of evils to be feared, the modern-day Baal worship, Roman Catholicism, not an American colonial indigenous Catholicism. No, no, no. We're talking about the European model of Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism. Catholicism by any name is the Church of Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan led by the vicar of Satan himself. The Protestant reformers were absolutely correct. And we have to change our ways or God is going to destroy us. If the, if the Romans don't do it, God will punish us just like he punished the Israelites. We ought to be on our knees in repentance before God. Repudiate Vatican Council too. We have no peace with the infidel. No peace, no negotiation with the Antichrist of the Bible. Are you a citizen of the United States of America? Or are you a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? You've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice. And making no choice is a choice. The line in the sand has been drawn, and not by any earthly finger, but by the finger of Almighty God. Now, you're not listening to a rabid anti-Roman Catholic bigot here. You're listening to a Bible-believing Christian, an Israelite, a true Israelite. Have no part with the heathen. Never mix the holy with the profane. And how can you prevent mixing the holy with the profane when you don't recognize either one? the holy or the profane. Francis Rooney is helping you identify the holy and the profane. And I'll assist him, but I can't make the choice for you. You've got to do that. You're citizens of a new kingdom. You have a king. You have a constitution. It's called the Bible. And you can't serve two masters. We'll be back right after these messages.
I pledge allegiance to the King of kings and to his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One holy nation and our heavenly Father, grace, mercy, justice for all. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Wow, the weather is beautiful, the cabin is terrific, and it's the first day of our vacation. Yeah. Honey, is there something wrong? Yeah, I just realized we forgot to pack the travel Berkey system. I can't drink this cabin water. And what am I going to do when I'm out on the lake? Now the whole vacation is ruined. Honey, cheer up. I brought our Spark Berkey purifiers. What? Yeah, I know you're picky about not having pathogenic bacteria, organic chemicals, heavy metals or foul tastes and odors in the water. So I packed our Spark Berkey purifiers. You know... This is a terrific cabin, and wow, have you noticed the beautiful weather? Don't ruin your vacation. Get a travel Berkey today for only $209, or get a sport Berkey for only $39 by calling 559-781-3773, 559-781-3773, or order on the web at firstamendmentradio.com. Travel Berkey not yet available in Iowa. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you wish to, if uh, you wish Inquisition Update to continue, please support, uh, sponsor first. Uh, please support First Amendment. I had trouble with that yesterday, didn't I? Look, I'm preoccupied with what I'm doing here on this program. I can't even say my own name without stuttering. Listen, this is important information. This is foundational. Protestant information you're getting here. This is history that you have been excluded from. You got to ask yourself why? Why is this ambassador coming out with this critical history now? Because they've got nothing to fear. Protestantism is dead. Don't you know the protest is over? Everybody believes in a future Antichrist. Now, that means the Pope is free to be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords again. We don't have to worry about Protestant uh, uh, reprisals for, a re for exposing this information now. Of course, we don't really want it, you know, taught in the schools. This is for Roman Catholics to know. The country's ours. We want it. It's ours now then you're free to be Catholic and to make everybody else Catholic and to help us in Washington do it. They got nothing to fear. No protest anymore. So here it is. The shift in Carroll's attitude, John Carroll changing his attitude 
going to be a Roman Catholic church now. The shift in Carol's attitude reflected a conservative, and always when you hear the word conservative out of a Jesuit's mouth, it means Council of Trent, Counter-Reformation, Council of Trent, burn them at the stake, stretch them on the rack, confiscate their property, torture them, kill them, make their children Catholic. That's the Council of Trent. If you believe the Mass is an abomination, you are damned. If you believe that you ought not to confess your sins to a priest, but to God only, you are damned. You know, I could go through all 100 anathemas of Protestantism that were leveled by the Jesuits at the bloody Counter-Reformation Council of Trent, but suffice it, this, just suffice it for now that you understand whenever a Carol or any other devout Roman Catholic talks about conservatism, he's talking about the Counter-Reformation, the Council of Trent, all right, the shift in Carol's attitude reflected a conservative. Why is he switching to conservatism? Because he's a Jesuit. They called the Council of Trent. That was their debut in Roman Catholicism. Shortly after that order was made, an order of the Roman Catholic Church by Pope Paul III, they called the Council of Trent to... to set the terms for the coming war against Protestantism, the coming global war against Protestantism. It would never have occurred were it not for the Jesuits. It could not have been conducted were it not conducted by the Jesuits. It's the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. Conservatism, you just know, means the Council of Trent and counter-reformation. Okay, the shift in Carroll Jesuit John Carroll's attitude reflected a Council of Trent trend throughout Western society after the anarchy and insurrection. Now, these are words used by John Carroll himself to describe the French Revolution. Let me tell you another secret. The Jesuits fomented the French Revolution. It was to punish the papacy and all the monarchies of Europe for the suppression of the Jesuits. The Pope suppressed and destroyed the Jesuits by a papal bull. And the Jesuits said, all right, then we're going to take over the church and we're going to conquer this world and we're going to rule it through our man, the Pope. Our Pope. It was a hostile takeover. The Revolutionary War, the second punch of the, of the one-two punch delivered first by the Protestant Reformation, the follow-up was the, the anarchy and insurrection. And why did John Carroll call it anarchy and insurrection? Because the Jesuits caused it. He knew exactly what it was. Protestantism was answered by anarchy and insurrection. Insurrection, the overthrow of the papal power. So that the Jesuits could reconstruct it under their image and put their man on the chair, Peter. Okay, Carroll's own words to describe the French Revolution was anarchy and insurrection. Where do you suppose he got those words? From his Jesuit master, the Jesuit general. Okay? The American Catholic Church experienced a large influx of European clergy, particularly French. Remember the French Revolution pitted one class of Roman Catholic priests against another class of Roman Catholic priests? And then one class of the Roman Catholic priests found themselves incompatible with the new French liberalism, guess where those conservative Roman Catholic priests went? The Council of Trent. Remember, I used the word conservative. So that means where did those Council of Trent Roman Catholic priests go? 
the liberals stayed in France, but the hierarchy, the ancient orient of the Roman Catholic priesthood came to America. Make sense? It says the American Roman Catholic Church experienced a large influx of European clergy, particularly French, in the late 18th and 19th century. So John Carroll's all of a sudden got a whole bunch of new warriors for the Pope. Conservative Council of Trent Catholic priests are coming to America to flee the, the, well, the Jesuit-imposed anarchy and insurrection of Europe. Literally at this point, America, the colonies, have become a haven for rabid Roman Council of Trent Catholic priests. Counter-Reformation Catholic priests. Look, Rome's not going to answer uh, this overwhelmingly Protestant colonies with just a whimper of Roman Catholic priests. No, 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 no. They're taking the cream of the, of the Catholic crop from France. And they're, John Carroll's going to get a lot of help. Going to take it a European direction, a Roman direction. And why better to do that than with Roman Catholic priests? Tridentine, conservative, Council of Trent Catholic priests. Have I made the point? Okay. Many of these priests were refugees of the French Revolution with a different experience of liberty and Catholicism than the native-born priests. In other words, they were more Roman Catholic than any native-born colonial Roman Catholic priest could ever be. Okay. It says, inevitably, their preference for tradition and order was observed, was absorbed into American Catholicism. What does tradition mean in the language of a Roman Catholic priest, a, a Jesuit priest? Tradition means Council of Trent. Tradition means, you, you know, you remember the passage of the Bible, Jesus said, full well, you, you, Suspend the, the, the law of God by keeping your own traditions. Okay? Roman Catholic canon law says tradition in the Roman Catholic Church is superior to the Bible. And what is that tradition? Well, the tradition is that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. The Bible doesn't say that. Tradition, that's what it means. Popery, that's what tradition means. Inevitably, their preference for tradition and order was absorbed. That order, that means complete, top-down, hierarchical control of the priesthood. Isn't that what John Carroll already started to organize and to centralize the American hierarchy? He'd already set the stage for these French priests to come in. He was already establishing the European order before the French priests ever helped uh, joined him. Okay? Inevitably, these French priests, their preference for tradition and order was absorbed into American Catholicism. It was just absorbed right in. There was no conflict. John Carroll had already made it a hierarchical church. Whatever happened to... Christ is the head, and we are all brethren. That's never the case in Roman Catholicism. The Pope is the head, and the priests are his vicars, hierarchical. The people are to be governed, never to govern. The people are to be governed. So therefore, you have to have a hierarchy. John Carroll knows this. He's a Jesuit priest. He's a traditionalist. He's a conservative. He's a rank, counter-reformation, Jesuit priest. 27 years of Jesuit education. He has sworn the extreme oath of the Jesuits to annihilate and to extirpate the heretics, Protestants, and liberals. And he's just whipped the American colonial 
the American Roman Catholic Church into the European style of Roman Catholicism. That is, he has injected a lethal dose dose of European Roman Catholicism into the colonies. It's not the same Roman Catholic Church that it was during the colonial period. It has now taken on the spitting image of her mother in Rome. France, the French priests are well at home when they come here. Remember, liberalism had taken over France. The Roman Catholic Church, the traditional Roman Catholic Church had been virtually destroyed. So the priest needed a new home, and John Carroll rolled out the red carpet for him. You know he did. He prepared this ground for, him, for them. John Carroll died in Baltimore on December 3, 1815, as the papacy was being reborn in Rome. Okay, the papacy was regaining a resurgence. We talked about, uh, you know, uh, Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte having a change of heart, a Jesuit change of heart, just like John Carroll had a Jesuit change of heart. He said he left behind an American church strong enough to stand on its own, yet leaning increasingly toward the Vatican, drawn by renewed papal gravity. Okay. The papacy is being reborn. The wound is being healed. And John Carroll has already prepared the colonial Roman Catholic Church to follow after the Pope. So much for patriotism, right? Dual loyalties. It's exactly why Roman Catholics are not fit for public service. Not fit as servants in the government because they will always change the government into a hierarchical system and govern the people with a rod of Roman iron. Okay? He says it was still a small church, just 2% of the population. Look what John Carroll could do with just 2% of the... Po Remember in the colonial times, they were less than 1%. Now they're up to 2%, baby. They're going to take this country by storm. You see the arrogance of the Roman Catholic Church? And remember, this author is enunciating the minority status of Roman Catholicism at this point, showing the enormous strides made by the, pa the papacy through John Carroll to, to, to demonstrate to you that this is a divine church. This is God keeping this church alive. Do you believe it? I'd say they have more diabolical help. Just 2% of the population, but within just a few decades, the American Roman Catholic experience would change into something that John Carroll could hardly have anticipated. Oh, he fully well anticipated it. He's a Jesuit. He took his orders from Rome. He did exactly what he was told to do. He knew exactly where he was going. There would be no surprises for John Carroll if he were to jump out of the grave and take a look at his masterpiece, the Jesuit enclave known as the United States of America. The Jesuits always win. There would be no surprise to him. Now, he said he would, have ple he would have been pleased by the remarkable growth of the Catholic population in the United States. Why would he be pleased and amazed by the increase in the Catholic population when he knew the Jesuits were going to force Catholics to move to this country through the potato famine in Ireland and, and the unholy alliance between the Pope and the, and, the, and the papal monarchs who had lost all their power and prestige in Europe? and knew that their last best hope was in the colonies, and they were going to force Roman Catholics, they were going to empty the prisons of Europe of Roman Catholic criminals, send them to this country, so they could vote in this democratic system, so that they could serve in the Catholicization of America. John Carroll knew all this stuff. None of this was secret to him. Okay, 
he would have been pleased by the remarkable growth of the Catholic population in the United States, but he would have been shocked by the new wave of anti-Catholicism that swept across the country after his death. Yes, that's right. You won't read about any of that in your history books in school. The counter, counter-reformation, the Protestants stood up and said, hey, just as we told you, they're flooding this country with Roman Catholics. We hear tell of an alliance between the Pope and the monarchies of Europe to Catholicize America. Every ship that comes to these shores with, with, with these poor huddled masses are all wearing crucifixes around their necks. And they're all huddled into the big cities under the big cathedrals, and they listen to the big the cardinals and the bishops and the popes and they vote however they're told to vote. That's what it means to be American to a Roman Catholic. Make America Catholic. Look, look, they can't call it home unless it's Catholic. So they've got to make it Catholic. They can be excommunicated from the church and suffer eternal damnations in purgatory and in hell if they don't make America Catholic. You see? Roman Catholicism is first and foremost a political institution cloaked under the guise of religion. And I dare not call it one more time Christianity or my tongue will melt in my mouth. Religion. Roman religion. Baal worship masquerading as Christianity, and it ought not to deceive anybody, but it has deceived the whole stinking world, and especially this land once called Protestantism. It's unbelievable what has happened. John Carroll would have been shocked by the new wave of anti-Catholicism that swept across the country after his death. And you know what one of the major components of that Protestant-led, that biblically-led protest against the Roman Catholic Church and the Catholicism of this country? It was book after book, sermon after sermon, campaign after campaign exposing the history of the Jesuits. And many of those books we've read right here on Inquisition Update, some of them written by Roman Catholics themselves. Can we doubt the history of the Jesuits when they admit what they do and glory in what they do? Shall we defy our own intelligence? And shall we defy the very gospel that we preach by ignoring or debating what is obvious? Now he says Charles Carroll's Charles or excuse me, John Carroll's cousin, Charles Carroll. Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the richest man in the colonies and the one who bankrolled the Revolutionary War. That's right. That's history. Undeniably history d ad admitted by, by uh, uh, J. Moss Ives in his book, The Ark and the Dove. You got to wonder how this Carroll, this immigrant, from Ireland amassed enough wealth to finance the Revolutionary War and what his motivation would be. Remember, they're a mercenary family. John Carroll's cousin, Charles Carroll, outlasted the bishop by another 18 years. Following the simultaneous deaths of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson on July 4th, 1826, and you gotta wonder why they died the same day. It, it, it's, it, it reeks of a, conspir a conspiracy. Anyway, they, jo they died together. On, they died the same day, July 4th, 1826. Charles Carroll, at 88 years old, became the last surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> 
Charles Carroll became the last surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence. Charles Carroll, the consummate mercenary warrior, first citizen, the richest man in the colonies, cousin to the Jesuit priest, and also Daniel Carroll, all three Jesuit trained, all three Jesuits. I know that's going a bit beyond the bounds. He wasn't an officially oath-spitting Jesuit, but he was educated by the Jesuits just the same. He was just as much a Jesuit as John Carroll, except he wasn't under oath, except the oath that he already swore to advance the papal chair to global supremacy, to colonial supremacy at the very least. The last man alive who signed the Declaration of Independence was Charles Carroll. You know, you'd think history was trying to set the man up on a pedestal to make him a, give him a deified status. Let me tell you something. In Roman Catholic teaching, Charles Carroll is the man. So is John Carroll. So is Daniel Carroll. When a Roman Catholic claims this country for the Pope, they do it in the name of John and Charles and Daniel Carroll. That's Roman Catholic history. That's colonial history. That's American history. And if we Protestants make light of that, there's a steamroller coming that only the Bible could rival for horror, that only the inquisitions of history could rival for horror. Charles Carroll was still robust six years later in 1831 when the French traveler Alexis de Tocqueville visited him. De Tocqueville was delighted to meet his, this living, breathing relic of American history and found Charles Carroll to be a man of intelligence and culture. His feelings for Carroll might well have influenced the long passage de Tocqueville later included in his classic, Democracy in America, in which he described American Catholics as, quote, fervent and zealous in the belief of their doctrines, unquote, and yet, quote, the most Republican and most Democratic class in the United States, unquote. De Tocqueville, De Tocqueville's assessment notwithstanding, anti-Catholicism, that is Protestantism, was already sweeping through the country by the time Charles Carroll died at 95 on November 14, 1832. Catholic immigrants started arriving in large numbers from Ireland and Germany. To nativists, this immigration seemed alien and menacing. Soldiers on the front lines of an obedient papal army that intended to conquer America. And I've run out of time. And certainly, looking back at this from our point of view, you have to know these anti-Catholic writers, these Protestant writers, were prophets. I'll be back next week. Don't miss Inquisition Update next week.